This is another of the videos that I'm doing in response to specific requests. People have emailed me asking what I think of the Patnax um, theory of imperialism. What I'm doing here is a short critical review of the book that's in the background. The book is called A Theory of Imperialism and it's by written, written by two economists, Utsa and Prabhat Patnak. And it was published by Columbia University Press in 2016. Now I've previously liked papers on demography by Prabhat. This included uh, articles he's written on the Great Leap Forward in China, comparing mortality rates in China during the Great Leap Forward with those in India at the same time, and stuff he's written on the decline in food self-sufficiency in the Indian countryside and the condition of Indian farmers. But in the course of reading their new book, I came across a series of claims that are, I think, ill-supported by evidence and argument. Background to this is that they are actually using concepts which come from Marshallian economics. A central argument of their whole mechanism for the way or their claim that imperialism is still operational is centered around what they claim is a vertical supply curve for tropical products. Now you'll never find anything about vertical supply curves in the Marxist literature and that's because they're taking this from Marshall who was a 19th century marginalist economist and the marginalist school grew up explicitly to counter the labor theory of value and the social democratic politics which was engendered by the labor theory of value. So one has to ask is this the right um, framework they should be using? What does a vertical supply curve mean? Well basically I have other videos critiquing Marshall and the notion of supply curves. But the no supply curve is something that's taught in introductory economics in the West and it says that you have a relationship between the quantity produced and the price at which it would have to be sold in order to be produced. And a vertical supply curve means that the the price of things goes almost exponentially. It shoots up after a certain point um, so that it, it may appear to reasonable climb here but then suddenly it shoots up and that's what um, the Pratt and the X are saying. Now let's leave aside whether or not um, supply curves really exist. What they're saying is that tropical products, and they include oil in this, why that's a tropical product is another question. They are claiming that tropical products have reached, or actually reached quite a while ago, their maximum level of production. Above this maximum level of production, the price rises vertically or exponentially. Now let's leave aside whether Marshall's economics is of any value, intellectual value. And let's assume that it has some intellectual value and say even within the framework of the Marshallian economics they're using, there are two big questions here. Is oil in fact a tropical product? And do tropical products have vertical supply curves? Now, they make what is an entirely false claim that less than one-eighth of the remaining oil and gas are in developed countries. But they provide no calculations or data tables to support their claim. And it's quite unclear what they mean by reserves because 
reserves of fossil fuel are a slippery beast. What exactly you mean and the level of reserves that you you see depends on your definitions. One definition is proven reserves. That is to say ones which have a 90% certainty of commercial extraction. Secondly are probable reserves where you don't really know how much you've got there but you think there's a 50 cent chance that it would be possible or the oil company thinks there's a 50% chance that they might be able to commercially extract it. And then there are the possible reserves where there's maybe a 10% chance that this area of land has oil under it that's worth extracting. Now obviously if you start looking at possible reserves there's a great deal more uncertainty but the reserves that are listed as possible will be much bigger than the proven reserves. But they don't even give any figures for which kind of reserves they're talking about. If we look at actual oil production we find that quite contrary to what the Patniks claim a very substantial part of world hydrocarbon production comes from the developed countries. So the developed countries produce 56% of natural gas and around 40% of oil. And it's because developed countries, including the former USSR, produce a substantial part of um, the world's oil and gas that the current crisis over the Ukrainian war and the sanctions against Russia which limit the export of Russian hydrocarbons is causing such a crisis. It's because a substantial producer is being withdrawn from the Western market and a producer that is a developed country because no one is going to be claiming that Russia is tropical. It's because of this that there is a, a, a huge energy crisis in Europe at the moment. And you can't understand the whole crisis in Europe over Ukraine if you disregard the long-term attempt by US politicians and US energy companies to win the European market from the Russians and to apply pressure that the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 pipelines under the North Sea, uh, sorry, the Baltic Sea, be closed down. The pressure for that comes essentially from US oil interests. But according to the Patniks, the developed world, and includes US and uh, Russia, contribute only a tiny percentage of, of world oil production. Well, if you, you've got analysis of the imperialist relations in the world today, that misses out what appears to be the major cause of a war between the great powers, well, you're not doing very well. Now let's look at tropical crops. The Patnaks have an underlying assumption that there is this vertical supply curve. And what they're saying is there's a fixed upper limit to the amount of tropical products that can be produced because of the shortage of land available for their cultivation. They explicitly say the output of products produced by the tropical landmass does not increase because of the fixity of this landmass, which is fully used up. And they make this claim that the tropical landmass has been fully used up in several places in their book. But to write this in an age when satellite imagery is well available and when these satellite images clearly show progressive deforestation of tropical areas and the replacement of forests by agriculture is, is completely delusional. The evidence is that the area given over to agriculture in the tropics has been increasing fast over the last 40 years 
And it may be that in the future this will lead to environmental degradation. But it's certainly not the case that all land in the tropics has long been used up. Let's have a look at some evidence for this. This is an area of Brazil photographed from space by NASA in 2000. Same area, 2019. Now you can see dark green is tropical forest. Light green is agricultural areas. You can see over an 18 year period the agricultural area has greatly expanded and you can see dense networks of roads being put in to serve the agricultural area. And it, let's zoom in a bit. Uh, and you can see in more detail, more dense networks of roads. Same area was just forest. At one time, this was forest. Now, there are just thin rows of trees around streams. You can zoom in further. Look at this area here. Roads have been put in, crossroads to access the fields. And then all that's left is forest around a stream where you can't effectively grow things. You're starting to get in tropical areas a process that took place in Europe hundreds of years ago where forests were cleared for agriculture. So that you're going to get in, in Brazil and places a landscape which from the air will look more like Europe, will be largely agriculture with isolated bits of forest. But this is the process that's taking place now. This is the expansion of agricultural land that's taking place. Higher magnification again. You can see the grid of roads with only the marginal forest left. Satellite data shows that on average, Africa is losing 0.4% of its tropical forests a year, Latin America 0.38% and Southeast Asia 0.9%. The Southeast Asia there includes Indonesia. Rapid growth of agricultural areas. Now, if we look at the vertical supply curve again, according to the Patnaics, because of their counterfactual claim that agricultural land is fully saturated, crops like coffee should be fixed by the land available. And the quantity of coffee shouldn't be growing because there's no more land. Now let's see what's actually happened. If we look at the 50 years, or four, 50 years from 1960, to 2010 we see that coffee grew from 400 just under 400,000 to 100 to 800,000 tons so doubled over that period more or less steady growth let's add to coffee cocoa again no sign of stagnation in fact this looks like an exponential growth curve What about two of the other main tropical products? Rubber and palm oil. Again, exponential growth. So in stagnation, they both underwent rapid growth instead of stagnation. The claim that the Patnaics rest their whole book on, that the available land in tropical areas was used up long ago, is just not true. There's been a vast process of clearing virgin forest Create, to create land for tree crops like the four I've just shown. And it's not just tree crops, also for soy. There's another section of their book where they attempt a critique of the Ricardian labour theory of value applied to international trade. I'm not going to go into this here. Uh, but it's worth saying that their fundamental problematic is very similar to Ricardo. Of course there's some finite limit to how much tropical crops can be harvested given the limited area of land in the tropics. But this is not something specific to tropical crops. 
And of course, I've shown we haven't reached that limit yet. There's obviously a limited area of land in the temperate zones as well. So any agricultural production in any climatic zone will eventually reach the situation where it's pushing at the limits of the available land. But it's ironic since they pose themselves as critics of Ricardo that the problem of declining agricultural productivity due to limited land area was at the centre of Ricardo's theory of, re of rent. And it was on the analysis of this decline in agro agricultural production that the economist Ricardo built his reputation. And he was doing that in a very specific historical circumstances. In the period of Napoleonic Wars, when Napoleon had imposed trade embargoes on the export of grain from Europe to Britain. And Britain therefore had to be self-sufficient in the growth of grain and the only way it could be done in a relatively small island and without the kind of artificial fertilizers we now have was by expanding agriculture up onto the hills from the plains where grain had normally been grown. And Ricardo observed that the effect of this uh, forcing of agriculture up the hills was that agricultural productivity fell and since labour was the source of value more labour was required to produce a tonne of corn and therefore the price of corn low, rose. Now that was around 1810 when agriculture really was moving onto the margins of hills to grow grain. Marx also analysed a theory, a differential rent and wrote a th uh, ch chapters of capital on differential rent. But he looks into the situation as it existed when he was writing, the 1860s, at which point you were beginning to see the effect of bringing into cultivation marginal lands on the US frontier. Now in Ricardo's case, labour input required on the marginal lands on the English hills was rising. But in the US, the marginal labour input was falling. If you walk through the woods of New England in New Hampshire or New York State, you'll come across old field boundaries, old dry stone walls, areas that in the 1860s were still being farmed for grain. Farming at the time Marx wrote, was moving west from New England onto the Great Plains, where land was better, less labour was required, and agricultural productivity was rising. The, the Great Plains yielded more per worker day than the soils of New England, and the consequence was a decline of agriculture in New England and the fall in the value of wheat. And this had a huge impact on the world. It wasn't just occurring on the Great Plains of the USA. It was occurring on the black soils of the Ukraine. In these two areas, you were getting a wheat exporting economy arising. A wheat exporting economy in virgin soils or soils which had not been cultivated for wheat for a long time if we take the steps of the Ukraine where there had been cultivation for wheat maybe at the time of Alexander the Great but that had fallen into decay due to successive depopulations um, due to plagues which had ravaged the area. Now when you have expanding areas of land, expanding into higher fertility areas, what happens is the price of grain or the price of the crops fall. Quite different 
to the situation Ricardo was analysing and quite different to the situation that the Putniks claim exists in the tropical world at the, today and on which they base their analysis. Let's look at what ha has ha happened to productivity. Um, these are Indonesia, Malaya and Brazil. And we're looking at 2008 compared to, uh, to 1993. The agricultural output in value terms of the constant national currency. I don't know what the Indonesian national currency is, but I got these from UN figures. Here is the agricultural workforce. And here is the... Um, value added per person year in constant 2010 national currency since it's in constant currency inflation proof currency that is a good measure of the actual physical rise in production and we can see that the productivity was only 91 percent i shouldn't have put the minus in there the productivity was only 91 percent of what it was so indonesia had a fall in productivity slight fall in productivity a nine percent fall in productivity on the other hand if we look at malaysia and brazil we see that the agricultural workforce in malaysia actually fell the value of agriculture per worker rose the production per worker was 155 percent of what it was in 1993 Brazil, it's even more marked, goes up to 200% of what it was in 1993. So, if all you could see was Indonesia, well, maybe the Ricardian analysis has some validity. If you are looking at um, other countries, no. most areas the productivity was rising or in leading exporting areas the productivity was rising ricardo's analysis of of crisis in capitalism was all down to the shortage of agricultural land this he said would cause a rise in rents and the rise in rents would drive down the rate of profit the patnaks make a similar claim they're saying the inelasticity of supply of tropical products means the entire monetary system of the capitalist metropoles is thrown into crisis. I'm not going to go into the details of the mechanisms by which they claim that. But the first step is they say that the rise in the price of uh, tropical agricultural products is supposed to produce a reduction in consumption in the local tropical country. They say even if the output of products produced on the tropical land mass does not increase because of the fixity of this land mass which is fully used up, supplies to the metropolis of these products can still increase as a consequence of their rise in prices. But this can happen only if the money wages of the workers or the money incomes of the petty producers, including peasants, who are engaged in producing this output, do not increase in tandem with the rise in prices. So then what they're saying is that it's only possible for the metropoles to import food from the tropics if under their supposed situation of an uh, inelastic supply curve the workers and petty farmers and the peasant in the tropics don't increase their income and therefore their consumption falls and because of their consumption falling, there's more available to export. But the problem is that it's, it's a completely incoherent story. The tropical crops which are exported don't actually enter into the real wage of the direct producers. There's lots of cocoa farmers in West Africa who've never eaten finished chocolate. Similarly, if you look at rubber goods, rubber goods make up a tiny fraction of the real wage of rubber tappers. The export of rubber 
is not achieved by the rubber tappers consuming less rubber. Even if the land available for tropical crops really was fixed, more expensive rubber and cocoa wouldn't price it out of the consumption of producers. The bulk of the food consumed by the rural population in Africa is made up of crops which don't on a large scale enter into a world trade, for instance yams, cassava, sorghum, teff and millet. Those are what provide the food for the farmers and it's not cocoa, it's not coffee, etc. But in fact agricultural prices don't generally rise. A rise in the production of rubber, palm oil, etc. is actually taking place on marginal land recently converted from virgin forest. And in Malay and Brazil, for example, we know this increase goes hand in hand with an increase in labour productivity and would therefore be expected to result in a fall in price. And only exceptionally in a country like Indonesia, where population has, in the countryside has grown very rapidly, does a falling labour productivity in agriculture occur. The problem of third world countries <coughs> has more been of the fall in the price of their exports rather than the price of the, their exports rising rapidly. But if they then go and say what's going to be the effect within the metropoles themselves of this rise in products. It says if the rise in prices are also affects the buyers whose money incomes do not increase in tandem in the metropolis itself then they too are forced to consume less. So this they say will then produce a, an economic crisis in the metropolis but it's really completely incoherent argument. A few sentences ago their claim was that exported output from the tropical lands had risen because the people within the tropics couldn't afford the cocoa, coffee, etc. themselves. But now the claim is that not only are the tropics consuming less, but the high prices means the metropoles can consume less as well. So, where is this stuff gone? Um, the increase in price was due to demand exceeding supply but now they're saying consumption is falling both in the metropoles and in the agricultural areas in the the tropics what's supposed to be happening to this supply there's a lot of other nonsense in the book i, I don't have the patience or the time to deal with it at the moment basically the patnex theory is a second rate version of the Ricardian theory of crisis. It's second rate because at least Ricardo had a more detailed class analysis of the supposed mechanism than what they propose. But their whole mechanism is fundamentally based on a false assumption, which one for which they produce no evidence because they can't produce evidence for it, that the tropical land in the period of imperialism was fully used up. 